it's my pleasure to be part of this training program um, uh, and um, uh, i uh, thank uh, for the organizers to giving me this opportunity where uh, uh, though um, now um, i am director of uh, indian plywood industries research and training institute and um, many trainees are the distinguished uh, participants for this training program must be wondering about uh, uh, my um, inputs on wood resource improvement and utilization so here i just wanted to tell that um, uh, this is one of the very important area uh, as long as, as far as the, uh, when we talk about wood resource uh, utilization that improvement part and uh, i happened to be a part of uh, on such research program where we focused on um, wood resource improvement uh, particularly uh, uh, not only in india but uh, in overseas also uh, uh, when uh, as dr harun said that i was a postdoc uh, in uh, new zealand and uh, worked extensively on uh, improvement in radiata pine um, for wood quality um, this is where uh, they were uh, finding it uh, very difficult uh, and uh, i happened to work on that so i have focused uh, uh, probably maybe we can have more of an interactive session uh, my uh, uh, talk on uh, wood resource improvement and uh, utilization aspect um, so just uh, uh, i'll go through uh, some of the basics um, in fact um, when we say wood uh, it has been um, an integral part of our entire civilization um, and uh, if you can say that uh, we say ki um, what human needs is the three things roti kapda and makan or food shelter um, and um, uh, cloth uh, now for all the three uh, wood has been a very very integral part whether we talk about shelter uh, in olden days also wood was um, a very uh, like it was a material for shelter uh, when um, humans realized that um, you can burn wood and create energy and this is how we started uh, uh, making food uh, using wood as a source of energy so it again contributed into that and um, uh, at later stage when it was realized that the wood can be converted into pulp and pulp can be converted into rayon and rayon can be converted into fabric so it also um, equally uh, contributed into uh, clothing so uh, wood has been uh, i would say it has been an unsung hero uh, for our entire civilization process uh and uh, why it has been you know, because um, it's the one resource uh, which has got multiple applications uh, it's that wood uh, we can use it for in fact this is a known to everybody uh, i need not to focus much on that is that uh, we know that it is can be used for timber uh, can be used for reconstituted wood products so that means wood composites uh, these days we talk about uh, it can be for energy uh, in primitively we have been using wood for energy and again there has been a renewed interest in uh, using wood or wood based materials for uh, energy purpose so whether uh, it can be using gasifiers or converting wood into ethanol uh, so there has been a renewed interest into that aspect also and obviously for pulp and paper uh, it has been a basic raw material um, and uh, so for all these four different sectors um wood is playing a very important role now when we talk about timber um you can have different applications again in timber uh, it can be for a structural purpose or it can be for handicrafts or it can be for uh, like you name it um, wherever um, a wood can come into the picture uh, so this is what the another beauty with the wood that it's a very versatile material um you can make um, uh, materials like uh, even um, um Uh, your uh, sticks uh, handicraft as i said um, then uh, you have match sticks uh, you have big buildings which is now a new trend where we talk about multi story building completely made out of wood so uh, such a versatility you don't see in any other materials uh, and this is where uh, wood has uh, uh, been a very very important material um, for um, us and uh, this is being well recognized also in fact it's not that uh, now only we know uh, even in uh, historically also uh, everybody knew like the people were knowing that how to use wood and this is how they could uh, make big big uh, ships and big uh, like old structures when we see 
they are amazing and they are all uh, made out of wood so uh, this versatility um, also comes with lots of factors and um, when we talk about as i said uh, if you see old buildings or old monuments lots and lots of wood is being used there uh, because it was one of the most preferred materials um, see steel aluminium and all those things have come at a very very late stages uh, where wood uh, was there right from starting and because it was easily available uh, from natural forest when uh, our pristine forest were rich uh, with different materials different species um, it was realized that it is very easy to process wood uh, with the simple tools uh, uh, unlike uh, steel or unlike uh, other metals where you really need furnaces melt them then mold them it was realized that the wood is much better uh, than any other materials and then longevity uh, with simple treatments uh, with uh, proper care uh, those structures could last hundreds and hundreds of years so that's why a wood was a preferred material also and another important thing uh, like if you just talk about uh, um, 100 years ago or something like that that no wood is good or bad it was only the different species different applications like we know that the raitya tintoria Uh, or whatever we call it, the like chenna patna toys, uh, what they use that wood. Now that species were known for handicrafts, whereas other species, when we talk about teak, uh, we know that it is very good for structural application. It, it's very good for furniture application. Now that's where um, we had lots and lots of choices in terms of species, and uh, there was nothing called good or bad. It was only that rational and efficient utilization of these uh, species. for different end application which mattered quite a lot um but and i just wanted to give some glimpse of that uh, that in india uh, we have uh, about 4000 uh, wood species woody species and out of 4000 almost 1600 has got timber value and uh, out of 1600 approximately about 160 50 to 60 has got commercial uh, values or they are commercial species there are plenty of them which are lesser known uh there are many which have not been studied but again now the availability of all those species also question because um, they are not available uh because most of them were sourced from the natural forest areas and one thing for sure is that uh, we uh, can't touch our natural forest to extract wood as such for commercial utilization um so um as i said our wood resources uh, from where it comes Uh, our wood resources come from natural forest uh, plantations which of late it started in fact uh, uh, first the teak plantation started and now uh, uh, this thing has changed over a period of time and now we talk about agroforestry or tree outside forest uh, which are fueling the raw material requirement to the wood based industries now uh, now the question natural forest is ruled out uh, we may not get uh, enough material to meet our uh, requirement in fact uh, if you see the timber requirement for the country uh, in 2020 was almost about 150 million cubic meter and um, almost 90 million cubic meter wood has come from tree outside forest and it's only about 3 to 4 million cubic meters so a very small proportion uh, which still uh, like which has been extracted from the natural forest as per the statistics uh, which is available so the plantation and agroforestry um, they are the major contributors to the wood resources now in the country it's not only here in fact in all other countries um, that the wood resources are basically from plantations and agroforestry uh, like my own experience with new zealand i would say um, they have one department of conservation which looks after only the conserving those resources which needs to be conserved other than that the wood production is more of an industrial production of wood so industrial plantations are there which feed to the industrial requirement and this is where i think uh, we also are uh, heading slowly uh, where uh, wood resources needs to be produced uh, in large scale uh, to fulfill the requirement of the industry and uh, which is not going to uh, like uh, the requirement for wood i am sure is going to increase it's not going to decrease uh, the way how the development is taking place in our country uh, and uh, the way the demand is increasing now if there is a huge difference in the wood resources which were coming from the natural forest and plantation forest 
Now, till 1990, I would say uh, that the major source of raw material was from forest, and there were the huge logs. Um, even when we see in Bangalore, uh, still uh, the material which was uh, imported from Myanmar and those which were grown here also, uh, you could see that the logs were big, uh, very mature trees with a rotation period of 80 to 120 years and um, excellent wood uh, without too much of difficulties in uh, processing or in utilizing. And now that's the, um, the gone the days uh, where you can get now these sort of materials. Now the age is for plantation forest. Now the plantation forests, they are categorized by short rotation. Uh, when we talk about a rotation period for pulp and plywood industry, uh, pulp industry, we talk about two years, three years. I think uh, morning um, Dr. H.D. Kulkarni would have deliberated on this. When we talk about for plywood industry, uh, the rotation period is about eight years, 10 years. Uh, this is what um, is desired by the plywood industry. And for solid wood, uh, again, the rotation period we want to, to have to about 20 years or something like that and this is what exactly i would say uh, happened in new zealand when the radiata pine had a rotation period of around 40 years initially 40 to 50 years and they brought it down to 20 years but uh, when this thing happened the bringing down the rotation to 20 years uh, having a managed plantation or having a plantation forestry in place um, there were lots of issues in terms of wood properties and wood quality now, uh, this is one of the general perception about these fast grown or uh, plantation timbers that they are highly variable. Uh, uh, there is a variability within tree, there is a variability between tree, there is a variability between plantations, uh, and they are known to have um, uh, quite variable properties. Uh, they are also characterized to a large extent, I will not say it's a generalized statement, that high, high moisture content because again, moisture content depends on the locality also and the growth pattern, but more or less say like there is always um, a debate on um, eucalyptus uh, because they consume uh, quite a bit of moisture. And even if you cut a eucalyptus tree, we can feel the amount of moisture present into those logs. And same thing goes with the other fast grown species that they do have high moisture content. Also, um, they are characterized by poor um, wood properties as compared to the mature trees. They are uh, characterized by a uh, small quantity of hardwood, uh, which was very important um, for wood uh, uh, as a timber. And um, they also are recognized by poor stability, means dimensional stability. Uh, lots of uh, these materials which are coming from plantation species, like whether you talk about a eucalypts or you talk about um, uh, acacias or you talk about in melias also in some cases, um, they tend to show lots and lots of shrinkage. Um, they tend to show lots of drying defects. Like if you would have seen silver oak wood, when you dry that, most uh, a large proportion of the sawn timber will experience uh, lots of twisting, lots of uh, drying deformation, uh, which are not desired by the industries. Then again, since they have very little hardwood, uh, are the amount of extractives are less. So they are uh, again considered to be non-durable uh, as compared to the uh, mature trees. And obviously they have a small girth. So again, the sawing processes becomes different. The recovery of the sawn material becomes different and overall their utility pattern also changes. And this is where exactly things are happening is that most of these small girth logs are being used for either composite woods um, um, whether it is particle board or whether it's a medium density fiber board, because it is much easier to use these sort of materials for uh, these applications rather than uh, using them for um, uh, sawn timber. Because when you have a very small girth, taking out uh, uh, a perfectly uh, uh, quality uh, piece or uh, sawn material out of uh, such a small girth log becomes very difficult. So these are some of the perceptions um, which are there with um, this fast grown species. And since now the total focus is on uh, uh, tree outside forest, um, those species uh, which can grow at a faster rate. Um, so this uh, needs to be tackled. Now, if you uh, see about our major wood industries, like we have, as I said, solid wood, wood based panels and pulp and paper. Uh, all these three industries will have very different type of requirement 
in terms of resource in terms of wood uh, which is uh, the properties in wood which is required to make this product uh, and uh, if you see uh, the market uh, like overall composition um, uh, almost 45% of wood uh, are that uh, wood based industries are solid wood though they may be unorganized or very uh, like uh, they are not very well organized industries uh, say uh, and wood panel it's about 30% and pulp and paper is about 25% now so almost 75% of the share is solid wood industry and wood panel industry uh, which requires substantial amount of wood of desired quality and same goes with the pulp and paper also yeah. so i'll just come on that issue a bit later now when we talk about um, say uh, in fact um, since um, all the distinguished participants in this uh, program is uh, from forest department and uh, we all are aware that uh, most of our resources are now confined to some of this fast grown plantation species whether it is uh, eucalyptus casuarina melia silver oak rubber wood acacia we may add some more into this um, um, uh, like melania arborea also can be added into that and there are some more programs which are going on but uh, more or less uh, we can add poplar into this uh, which has been a major wood species in north um, in uh, punjab haryana and uh, uttar pradesh belt uh, now most of these species have a specific application areas like um, we don't think of using eucalypts for uh, sawn timber uh, or we don't think using casuarina for uh, anything like which can be used for timber purpose so all those things are still confined to either use for pulp or um, now we talk about using these uh, eucalypts for uh, plywood in fact most of the plywood industries in yamuna nagar uh, are in northern india they depend heavily now on eucalyptus and poplar for their plywood production similarly when we turn towards south it's that melia dubia species or melia species and silver oak they are the major species which are used for plywood and other composites uh, so whether it's a particle board or mdf and uh, similarly when we talk about rubber wood and acacia now acacia was initially planted as an energy material or energy planting material but uh, over a period of time it has been now very well recognized that acacia auriculiformis can be a very good timber which can be comparable in many properties with teak uh, whether it is appearance or whether it is certain mechanical properties obviously there are some limitations there are some properties which are lower than teak um, though so immediately we cannot directly say that uh, acacia auriculiformis is a replacement for teak but to a large extent uh, acacia fulfills the requirement for making let's say furniture uh, uh, home furniture and uh, in many part of the countries now this is being used for furniture similarly uh, there are species like mango and others uh, which are used uh, for uh, those application now this is general trend i am just showing um, uh, there may be other things now uh, the other trend which is going on as i said because we are having a small girth lots so the trend is using more and more wood composites now when we talk about wood composites there are two specific categories one is panel product where we talk about plywood particle board medium density fiber board now these sort of materials can be made into um, big sizes so you can have uh, um, width 4 feet length 8 feet um, and uh, uh, they are excellent in terms of uh, their uh, uh, property variation in in the sense Uh, like plywood is more or less uh, we call it a homogeneous material which is unlike a wood which is um, an isotropic material uh, where the properties changes with direction and that's why the plywood came into the picture and it's a very specific uh, uh, and uh, uh, panel product um, the same thing with particle board and mdf uh, uh, the beauty with the particle board and mdf is that we are not bothered about the size of the tree shape uh, whether it is crooked in nature Uh, because ultimately of a particle board and density fiber board you need to pulverize the material so any type of even woody waste generated by the other wood based industries can be a raw material or can be a resource for these sort of industries and uh, many mdf and particle board industry i would say in the country are now thriving on uh, 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 materials like uh, leftovers of uh, uh, eucalyptus and uh, poplar and melia Uh, after using for veneering whatever is the leftover part is uh, there 
it can be used for making these sort of boards so these composites provide a great opportunity to use every bit of our woody resources for high value product similarly uh, since we have limited availability of uh, uh, big girth logs and uh, in that case uh, we have very limited availability of large size of uh, sawn timber like getting uh, um, earlier uh, 8 by 8 uh, scantling was not difficult but now getting 4 inches by 4 inch section itself becomes difficult uh, and for that uh, structural requirement again the engineering has come into the picture and uh, the new ways uh, where we could develop composite materials again something like glue laminate where you can use smart uh, like uh, small strips from plantation timbers glue them together and make big sections something like laminated veneer lumber or cross laminated timber. Um, so all these uh, like uh, parallel strand lumber and there are many other composites which come into the category which can be used for a structural application. So they can be used for load bearing elements. Uh, and now this is a big trend all over the world that uh, these sort of structural composites are being used in building constructions. Whereas panel products, they are not considered to be load bearing elements, but they are extremely good for partitioning. Um, and uh, this is where uh, particle boards and MDF are being used. Uh, and same thing goes with the plywood. Now the beauty with um, composite material is that you can make composites with a range of properties and with a range of materials. And this is where exactly I'm just showing here that if you take fibers, you can make paper and from paper, you can make insulation board, uh, when you do the pulping and you can make hardboards and uh, MDF it's a different type of uh, process where you uh, segregate individual fibers and again glue them using an adhesive and make a, a medium density fiber board and now in this again we are getting high density fiber board now this does not require or they don't have any limitation in terms of uh, material requirement or any specific sizes or something like that when we talk about particle boards uh, and um, oriented strand boards, again, particle boards are very convenient where you use particles, whereas uh, oriented strand boards, uh, they require a bit longer particles um, and wafer boards where they require uh, chips uh, in that sort of form and uh, convert into boards. But moment we go towards uh, veneer based or blocks based composites, whether it is plywood, LVL, glue lamb or uh, cross laminated timber, um, here, the wood quality requirement comes into the picture because for plywood, you need to peel logs into veneers and for peeling, certain properties are required. If the wood is very dense and it's a very brittle in nature, peeling becomes difficult. Your knife goes blunt very quickly. Now, that's where the requirement is that the density should be low, but when the densities are low at the same time, the material should have enough strength properties uh, they should have uh, properties uh, like they should not bring too much. They should not develop many cracks uh, while drying. So these are the property requirement for panel products which come in the picture the moment we go for veneers and um, block-based uh, uh, composite materials. And uh, this is where uh, we need to uh, develop our wood resources to meet the requirement for these particular products. Now, if I just go a very conventional approach of wood utilization, probably I would say in our country is that you get the material um, and again says, forget about natural forest. So we are getting from plantation forestry, agroforestry, uh, like we are getting lots of rubber wood and rubber wood has made its own niche um, in uh, wood products. Uh, like most of the furnitures are made out of uh, rubber wood uh, where you do conversion, convert, process it. And now processing could be seasoning, treatment, uh, our proper sign and make the product and ultimately the product goes into the market um, and uh, once the consumer buys it and uh, that's the end of the story now this is where the problem comes that if a product made from such fast grown species fails uh, at early stages or if um, not get uh, liked by the pro uh, consumers then the entire species gets uh, devalued uh, and something like what has happened with eucalyptus is that there are, you have number of eucalyptus species. Some of them are very good in, for furniture. Some of them are not good for furniture, but they are very good for pulp. But then oh, oh, nobody would like to touch eucalyptus for any uh, material uh, like for furniture applications. Now, this is where uh, the resource improvement comes into the picture because 
the parameters uh, which can influence the products are the quality of the raw material and uh, it's not something new in fact and then processing whether we talk about forestry resources or wood resources or we talk about uh, agricultural resources now, when we talk about let's say tomato or apple again um, for tomatoes uh, uh, the industry which is making um, um, uh, tomato sauce require tomato with long shelf life with thick skin uh, so that and more pulp whereas if i am using tomato at my house probably would not prefer with thick skin and would prefer with more pulp so it all depends on the requirement and this is why uh, in agriculture sector uh, lots of improvement has gone depending on the requirement to the industry uh, because the industries have, are big a very organized industry and at the same time processing has also come into the picture um, and uh, processing technologies have evolved over a period of time this thing is also happening in the wood sector also where the new technologies are emerging uh, and this technologies are also being implemented in resource improvement and this is what um, i thought we will talk about that so when we uh, say about wood resource improvement and um, i think everybody would be agree on this forum that uh, most of our tree improvement programs uh, have focus on uh, maximizing tree growth and uh, shortening the growing time so what is our uh, main focus has been on growing a tree which is a big tree a straight tree uh, which is free from probably from insect pests and um, this has been even a criteria for probably plus tree selection um, uh, i'm not expert in this field uh, but uh, a little bit of experience what uh, i had uh, in uh, previously uh, so this has been focus it's not only here um, it has been a focus everywhere in other parts of the uh, world also and this is where i got uh, involved with these sort of resource improvement and this has been a major issue with new zealand that they focused on growing big radiata pine at a short period uh, 20 years to 25 year rotation but in that process they suffered in terms of wood properties considerably and um, this is what um, this is a picture in fact i would say this is a picture from um, fri rotorua uh, if uh, you know that now it is known as scion uh, it's a radiata pine uh, trial and uh, uh, where uh, every tree looks perfectly alike um, and they were all looking very nice um, but what is inside nobody knew and in fact some of the experiments were conducted and we found that almost 40% of this wood is not suitable for any um, application which requires load bearing criteria so neither it was suitable for structural application nor it was suitable for even furniture and other things so then the material goes for low value product so it goes for probably small packaging then it will go for mdf it goes for pulping and this is what it happens so uh, Uh, what is inside that is also equally important it's not only that nice looking trees and these are some of the examples um, which we have uh, done probably in india itself that um, some of the eucalyptus uh, after uh, drying them um, they behave like this now this is due to excessive shrinkage which takes place in eucalyptus now this is silver oak i said many of the silver oak boards uh, will get to twist after drying Uh, now these have become a uh, bow shaped samples um, this is a very peculiar example of uh, um, milia dubia uh, where we have taken increment cores and when we looked into increment cores and dry them and after drying if such thing happens then obviously that wood which is being grown inside those trees is not of good quality and uh, then it will devalue that our resources now again um, this i would like to show this is the work which we did Uh, probably uh, it was done in karnataka only and we took some increment cores and uh, after drying the cores you may find that difference um, like four cores i am showing here and um, two cores they remain straight two cores uh, you can see the amount of deformity after drying and the question comes that what do we want to grow so what should be our resources like be and uh, i am sure there won't there won't be any ambiguity on this thus we would like to grow trees which can have wood uh, which do not deform uh, after processing so this is what um, when we talk about wood resource improvement is desired um, and um, in fact uh, dr ashok also would have uh, talked uh, yesterday on this 
and we'll, when we talk about what is the market, what is the product, and what is the economic drivers. So like industry looks for economic drivers. And economic drivers, like when we talk about pulp and paper, it's that chemical consumption. How much chemical it is consuming to digest a wood and converting into pulp. Then energy consumption, whenever it goes for mechanical pulping or even for chemical pulping, how much energy we are putting in. Uh, pulp yield, that's a very, very important criteria for pulp and paper. See, most of the pulp paper industry, uh, the pulp yield from eucalyptus, if you talk, it's about 45% to 52%. And every 1% increment in pulp yield can make huge difference in terms of economy uh, for the industry. And this is where the pulp yield becomes very, very important criteria and economic driver for pulp industry. For solid wood, we have different criteria. As I said, if there is a lots of drying degrades, then um, uh, you, you don't get that value of its on timber. Uh, similarly, if the recoveries are less, again, um, you know, we get a less value of the timber. And for composites, it's very much similar what we get for solid wood. But for these economic drivers, there are some fundamental wood properties which derive those or which drive those uh, um, uh, economic criteria. And these are like wood density. It's a very important criteria, like cellulose content. Now in eucalyptus, cellulose content can vary anywhere from um, 36% to 50% or something like that. Lignin content, it's a very important criteria for pulp because lower the lignin, it's much easier to get pulp and you get higher pulp yield. And this is where uh, there is lots of genetic engineering is going on. And probably um, you must be aware in that in Canada, they designed a tree which has a very little amount of lignin just to support the tree during its growth period. And they said, these are the resources meant for pulp industry so that you can reduce significantly on chemical consumption and on energy consumption while pulping. Same thing goes with the solid wood. You have criteria like wood density, strength, stiffness, stability. These are the parameters which are very, very critical for solid wood applications. For composites, again, density plays a very important role. Um, and this is what it happening is that uh, uh, most of our plywood nowadays, um, uh, since the densities are lower and the face veneer face uh, has got low density, low strength. So most of the plywood which are made from the lower quality materials do not conform to the Indian standards. And this is where the resource improvement comes into the picture that can we improve the density of this fast grown species? Can we improve the strength and stiffness of uh, these species which are suitable for making composite materials? Um, so wood resource improvement, um, I would say is very, very important for um, stabilizing the process parameters because if your uh, raw material is variable, the processing condition changes. So whether it's uh, making um, uh, plywood or making particle wood or making uh, MDF wood or even when we are working on solid wood, if uh, there is a lots of variability in the material, um, then uh, it affects the processing uh, and uh, also that processing parameters keep changing. So to stabilize processing parameters, we need to reduce the variability. Uh, it also reduces the processing cost because now you have uniform material coming up. Uh, so obviously the processing cost come down. And also since you can design or you can improve trees according to the end uh, product. So the processing cost will automatically come down. Uh, though, so increasing consistency. And the last two points are more closely associated with the tree improvement program our silvicultural or management practices where we can decide on the harvesting schedules and create specific breeding material, like how we can further improve um, generation by generation uh, in terms of wood properties which are required by the industries. See, growing, uh, growth is very important because it clearly links with the productivity, but at the same time, the quality of the material is also equally important because it relates with the quality of the end product. So these wood resource improvement should be given equal emphasis uh, along with the growth parameters when we talk about the uh, uh, tree improvement program. So I would say like what I showed earlier you that development of wood resources. So uh, it should not end at the product acceptance and there should be a feedback uh, going back to those breeders or um, researchers or um, those people who are involved into that improvement 
um, and saying that, okay, what are the criteria which we need to look into that so that we can improve upon the quality of the material. So can we tweak um, genes? And in fact, just before the start of this lecture, we were discussing uh, from Director IWST, Dr. M.P. Singh and we, that can we have something like engineering or uh, uh, like now biotechnology has become uh, such a big tool. Uh, so can some of those can be played around or can silvicultural practices can be played around so that we get desired properties in our resources and uh, it will help on efficient utilization of the material. So um, if we just go uh, probably uh, we we'll say, what are the keyword properties? Um, as a uh, with an improvement perspective, we should look into that. And uh, if you see that previous table, which I showed that the density is one of the very important factors. Now, this is a very important factors for many softwares which are uh, grown outside the country or like in New Zealand, Radiata Pine, density was a very, very critical criteria. Uh, but even in our country also, when we talk about poplar, when we talk about Melia dubia, when we talk about even other species like Islanthus, um, why not to improve on the, their densities? Because when we talk about higher density, uh, everything uh, subsequently uh, becomes better. Because on uh, on a large scale, density reflects many of the wood property. Uh, with that, we talk about strength, or uh, then stiffness is another property uh, which is related with the very inherent uh, characteristics of wood. Uh, then we need to go to the cell wall level uh, and uh, uh, that those are the criteria which defines the stiffness of wood along with the density. So it's a very key criteria, um, not only for wood, for timber, but also for pulping and also for composite making. Uh, similarly, stability, chemical composition, I said uh, the cellulose content, lignin content, extractive content for many panel products, the extractive contents are not too much desired because they play um, with adhesives. So they can interact with the adhesives. So there may be delamination, uh, which can take place. Similarly for pulping also, uh, too much of extractives are not desired. And then fiber quality, obviously it plays a very important role for with, whether we talk about MDF or we talk about pulp. So these are some of the key properties of which needs to be improved in most of our wood resources or which needs to be looked into. And fortunately, many of these properties are also heritable in nature. So we can improve upon with generation by generation. And uh, since heritabilities are higher uh, for let's say for density. Uh, so when we do a proper selection for high density material, we are sure that the next progenies will also have a high density. And uh, that's how the whole improvement uh, pro program takes place. But the only problem or the difficulty is what uh, as a researcher or those who are involved into tree improvement uh, faces is that um, how do we measure these wood properties at large scale in large number of trees? Because for growth, it's very easy. You go, you measure the tree height, we measure the tree girth uh, using just a measuring tape, um, or uh, you can just uh, have a visual observation on um, insect pest attack. Uh, so most of those criteria uh, were not depending on too much of sophistication or too much of uh, instrumentation. And the moment we talk about wood traits, then uh, the limitation was that most of those conventional approaches were destructive in nature because if I want to measure the wood strength, then I need to cut a tree, get the sample, bring it to the lab, test it in on a universal testing machine. And that may take at most six months. Uh, and again, you have a limitation that you can't do it in a large number of samples. And uh, alternatively, uh, what we should have is that non-destructive way of testing. So how best we can get an estimate of certain wood properties non-destructively without cutting trees, without damaging trees, um, and uh, they should be reliable. Uh, we should be able to go into the field and do these assessments. And uh, since technologies are evolving, uh, there's a rapid in changes in the technologies. So definitely a number of tools and techniques have evolved over a period of time. And um, I would just list some of them here. In fact, there are many others um, like Pilodine, um, which was originally developed to assess the decay in wooden structures and later found uh, utility in uh, tree improvement program uh, for selecting trees with high density. 
Uh, then subsequently came resistograph, then you have X-ray methods, um, then uh, uh, near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, it has emerged as a very, very uh, powerful tool to assess uh, certain wood quality parameters. And again, I would say here that uh, many industries, even in India, like uh, ITC uh, and other industries, they are using this NIR spectroscopy technique uh, in improvement program of uh, their uh, materials for pulping because it can be related to a range of properties. Similarly, the tools like uh, electrical resistance tomograph, um, which can tell about the hardwood content without cutting a tree uh, that came into the picture. Then um, acoustic technologies, the sound technologies are uh, sound waves that has emerged a very, very important tool or technique for assessing wood parameters um, in a standing tree uh, uh, as well as in big logs. So either you can characterize wood in log form or in standing tree, both will be able to help uh, considerably in terms of utilization as well as in terms of resource improvement. Now, just quickly, I will go through some of this. This, this is a pelodin tool. Um, I you know some of you would have seen it. It looks like a gun and it has a flat pin. And so only thing is we need to do is that we can remove a little bit of bark, small, uh, create a window, remove the bark portion and use this tool. So that pin goes with a known force inside wood. So deep it penetrates, um, lower is the density. Less it penetrates into the wood, higher is the density. And the pin diameter is just about five millimeter. So it's not going to damage tree. And uh, this has been a very good tool, in fact, uh, which can be related with the wood basic density. And these are some of the relationships which have been developed in India. Um, as a part um, when um, I was also involved in such a research programs uh, where we could uh, say that if wood penetrates less than about nine millimeter into the uh, this payload in pin, the densities are going to be above 500, 550 kilogram per kilometer. If it is more, the densities are on a lower range. So this is a very powerful tool. In fact, um, number of species have been tried. This has been done on Acacia auriculiformis. And again, you can see there's a very good correlation with pelodin penetration and uh, wood basic density. Um, now, this can be a very handy tool uh, when we are selecting it for high density. And uh, this is, you can just go in a plot, either we can do all trees or we can just have first preliminary selection. And from there, a subpopulation, again, we select first based on the growth parameters and further selection, based on the wood properties where uh, pelodin penetration can be used as an estimate. I don't say that it's a very um, uh, accurate in terms of telling you that what is exactly the density, but it can definitely classify or categorize into high density, low density and mid density material. So this has become a very powerful tool. Then came resistograph. Um, again, it's a similar to what a uh, pelodin is there. And again, this is also, you have very small needle it's about one millimeter, which goes into the wood and uh, the resistance observed by the needle is converted into torque and you get a spectrum or what you get a graphical representation. Wherever there's a low density, there will be low torque. There's a high density, high torque. And um, again, it's a tool which was designed for detection of decay in wooden structures, but now it has become a good tool for screening or resource improvement for density, wood resource. Uh, I would say acoustic te technology, um, uh, my most of work has been um, focusing on this, uh, where we can use sound waves and uh, know that how effective they are in telling us about the wood properties. And it has been very clearly told because it is based on the fundamental principle of physics. The, the velocity of sound in any material depends on the density of the material and the modulus of elasticity of material. So now when we send sound, into the wood and measure the velocity of sound, it can tell us about two different properties. And this is why uh, this has become a very important tool and uh, it has been now extensively used uh, by um, many in uh, other countries, including USA, South America, Europe, uh, and Pacific uh, areas also. And I would say now even this is picking up in India also, uh, where it is being used and we have tried to use it on number of species and uh, 
first we need to convince and show that this works even on Indian um, hardwood species. So uh, it has been already proven uh, technology, uh, which has come into the picture. Uh, uh, it's a very simple. Uh, in fact, when we do it on logs, we can do it in the field. Uh, just hammer. Uh, it is something like the carpenter used to is that they used to hammer a piece of wood and it can tell you uh, carpenter whether this wood is good or not. So it's basically that reverberation or the sound spectral signature of sound or uh, listening to that sound, uh, you can tell what quality of wood can be there. Uh, so this is the technology and this is, uh, we have shown some uh, spectral signature on that, that how it uh, behaves. And uh, it's related with the wood velocity, uh, speed of uh, sound or sound velocity in wood. Higher the speed or higher the velocity, higher the modulus of elasticity. It's as simple as that. And particularly when we are doing it in green condition, um, it becomes much simpler. Uh, the relationships are much simpler. Um, so this technology um, is very effective. In fact, uh, we have worked with one industry in pulp industry uh, in Australia, and we could show it that by segregating their logs, they could save 20% of energy in mechanical pulping. So all the logs which were showing high acoustic velocity required less energy in pulping and which is a big boost for the industry. And now this uh, resonance tool cannot be used on uh, standing tree. So there are alternative options, like uh, you can send a pulse and measure the time it takes to reach from one point to another. And again, this tool has become very, very popular. Um, it's a very handy tool, slightly bigger than the mic, uh, your mobile phone. And uh, now the new versions are coming up, which do not have even these cables. Uh, so this is all Bluetooth program. So we just need to hammer these two probes. And the moment you hammer this probe, and it will tell how much time yes, it takes. Sir, I will tell you. No, no, I There are other things are also like ultrasonics. Again, these tools are available, where actually you can test very small diameter material. Uh, so this was meant basically to test seedlings. And there are some attempts whether you can test the seedlings or very young trees and tell about the wood properties when they are uh, going to be about eight year or 10 year or that harvesting tree. So these are some of the methods which have come into the picture. Uh, this uh, is growth stress. Again, this is one technology. I would say uh, here um, IWST has also worked extensively on this um, where this is a problem with the eucalyptus and acacia. The moment you cut the eucalyptus tree, it develops cracks. And those cracks are because of the inherent stresses inside wood. Now we can measure these stresses. And there are thumb rules that when you measure the strain, if it is less than 700, it will not develop cracks. And this we have seen. And uh, so uh, these are the methods where actually that can help in creating resources for uh, both pulp wood or for solid wood or uh, when we talk about uh, um, plywood. I already specified As about this is ERTs. Um, uh, again, uh, it's another tool which has come, which can tell you how much is the uh, hardwood. You can see that red color portion. And this is actually what you see uh, in the, when you do the validation. And it was very clear that it tells you that about the hardwood. So these are some of the uh, work which uh, we try to do an Arcana, um, and uh, even we try to do with the red sender also some quality assessment. Um, uh, and these are some of the results I would like to share here that these methods can be adopted uh, easily. It do not require a very highly skilled once people know that how to use these tools and how to interpret the results, they can be easily used. Um, so here, this is a variability in a nine year old Milia dubia which was grown by the State Forest Department. We did some extensive work on that. And you can see here, there's a significant variation. Now, if you collect seeds from all the trees, you may find again variable resources. Now, if I identify some of the trees which are having high wood density, high modulus of elasticity, high hardwood uh, uh, proportion, and then collect seeds from those trees and then propagate them, then probably our next resources, our next generation would be much better in terms of this wood properties. And this is how 
so we can design or decide upon the um, criteria so like low payload in means high density and high velocity means high uh, modulus of elasticity and other good properties so these are the potential breeding materials or these are the trees which should be used as a how to say a resource for improving the uh, next generations in our plantation programs uh, similar examples are here for eucalyptus terryticonis um, this was done with the itc clones and you can have a number of clones we can evaluate uh, it's not a lengthy process and definitely some of the clones i said anything which is 700 and less it will not they are less liable to show any cracks and um, uh, high modulus of elasticity less growth strain now these are the probably ideal clones which should be propagated for solid wood uh, or this should be propagated for composite wood uh, so uh, these uh, um, criteria are there and um, i just want to share this one example um, or uh, my own experience uh, which i did with australia uh, southern cross university in lismore and they were keen in identifying certain families which are good uh, for solid wood and this is their one of the major species eucalyptus danii and um, uh, in 3 weeks time i would say 3 weeks time 48 families were tested for wood properties and out of 48 families about 8 families were suggested to the university uh, for further breeding program which were good in terms of drying defects uh, which were good in terms of uh, sowing defects low growth stresses moderate density and uh, good stiffness so number of parameters can be taken up and in fact uh, these are all available i think in the public domain also there are published papers uh, which can be used so you can again see there are range of parameters and again done within 3 weeks so these tools provide as an opportunity to do at a very quick assessment which are reliable uh, which can be repeatable and uh, which can be used in large number of trees for resource improvement uh, this is one example in fact uh, we uh, myself and dr arun who is the coordinator of this program interestingly we went um, to uh, near belagam in karnataka and we found some eucalyptus palita plantation which was getting harvested for pulpy and there were trees which were perfectly identical in look and we tested about 150 trees probably in about 2 days and uh, we could see huge variation in terms of their wood properties like there were some logs with very high velocity some logs with low velocity similar trends we observed in the pelodin so that means there was a variation in terms of wood density now this is the opportunity if i want to select some of the trees for breeding program probably we could have gone with the high the stress wave velocity so they were all perfectly identical in their sizes so girth wise they were same but property wise there was still variation so this is exactly i said if you want to improve our resources wood resource improvement program um, this is what is desired without compromising on growth if we can also improve on the wood properties this will give us added advantage in terms of utilization of these resources um this was one program um, with ifgtb in collaboration with ifgtb uh, we were trying to do is that uh, screening some of the eucalyptus for pulping process it is still going on and uh, now validation has to be done uh, that uh, you have a number of clones now there are a range of clones uh, which are being released now whether these clones can be tested and validated for their pulp yield uh, either we have to do the pulp yielding operation and all those things nir is one tool and uh, whether that acoustic velocity also can be a tool so that a large number of uh, trees can be tested large number of clones can be tested uh, this is one of the examples where we try to do with about 100 clones of eucalyptus um, and um, still uh, the final analysis is going on uh, and um, repeatability heritability and all those things can be calculated for many wood properties here so this is an opportunity basically um, that um, whatever uh, we take any population you always have this uh, dumbbell shape curve or what we call as a gaussian distribution uh, around the mean uh, the only thing is that can we shift this mean towards right side and get um, resources with better properties and this is what that appropriate traits for resource development uh, which we need to do and these tools can play a very important role uh, in this process 
and why it is important now is that we are now more and more dependent on this plantation timbers and these are the materials now available for most of the timber applications so the more focus has to be there on improving these resources which can fulfill the requirement for the wood industry um, because wood industry is seriously looking uh, for resources whether it is plywood industry or uh, vertical wood industry or mdf or even wood industry uh, like sawn timber handicraft the material which are suitable for their requirement and now our dependency on this fast grown timber is only um, uh, uh, is too much so we need to grow more with desired qualities and um, there is a perception or the, there is a paradigm which is shifting now and that we need to use more and more wood uh, because wood has become very relevant in this climate change um, i'll just end with this message only uh, and we need to understand that there is no better material than wood for many products uh, because most of other materials whether it is for construction uh, if you talk about construction, what we use now is steel, aluminum, concrete, glass, bricks. They all are highly energy intensive material. Their embodied energies are too high compared to wood. So amount of energy required to process, required to make these materials are too much. Uh, and in this current climate change scenario, um, the ultimate uh, focus goes on timber. And this is where most of country, most of um, developed countries are many countries they have started using more and more wood for many other products um, even for buildings and obviously growing wood um, when you grow wood uh, there won't be anything better than um, that uh, for our environment so uh, the only question uh, here that argument is that where is the land available and all those things but again uh, this is not we need to conserve our resources and um, give more focus on growing tree outside forest and agroforestry uh, comes into the picture. Uh, and when we talk about those agroforestries, this resources with desired quality becomes uh, very important. So that at the end of the um, uh, rotation, the farmers should also get um, the value of their material which they are growing. And uh, it's all known, wood has tremendous environment benefits. Um, so. Uh, low embodied energy, carbon neutral. When you grow trees, you do, uh, we are doing carbon sequestration. When we are using wood uh, for the products which have long shelf life, we are also storing carbon for a longer period. And this is one thing, like uh, wood should be used for the products which have longer shelf life because then you have, a, like in olden days, furniture used to last for 60 years, 80 years, 100 years. Nothing used to happen to the wooden furniture. Now there are processing technologies where even this short rotation materials can also be processed. Composites can be made, which can have a long, long, long life. Uh, and uh, so there are many of these advantages uh, which need to be understood uh, by every one of us. Uh, then only um, uh, we can take this message forward um, because one cubic meter of wood is a storehouse of about 400 kgs of carbon. Uh, which is very very uh, important uh, so the last slide like wood is a material for our sustainable future so we need to focus on resource improvement and also its utilization uh, because it's a renewable uh, it's a reusable it's a degradable uh, we are already facing problem with the plastic plastics are also fantastic materials in terms of their versatility but when it comes to degradation they have become a nuisance they have become a big problem environmental problem now that's not the case and now everyone is looking towards biological materials uh, which can replace plastics and, um, uh, and for certain application now we have shifted to pvc door frames pvc window frames in construction can we again think of going back to wood or wood based composites uh, so this is what we need to look into that uh, recovery of energy content at the end of its life uh, what we say uh, properties of wood uh, what we call as a specific properties or per unit weight basis properties they are comparable with other materials um, obviously it's diverse and naturally beautiful um, the one very important thing is, is that uh, which can be produced sustainably and this is where uh, our focus should be there producing sustainably uh, quality raw materials of, which is required by the industry 
um, uh, and for the consumer as well. So thank you very much um, for listening uh, to this.